The Russian Revolution of 1917 was one of the turning points of the 20th century. Even after the fall of communism in 1989, the power of the present-day Russian state still depends on foundations laid by dictator Joseph Stalin in the 1930s and 1940s. But how did Stalin come to power? How could the freedom and hope that millions of Russians felt when the Tsar was overthrown in 1917 turn into the oppression and exploitation of Stalin's Russia? This episode of Timeline looks at revolution and counter-revolution in Russia. Russia was a ramshackle empire when it entered the First World War. The Tsar and the Russian aristocracy ruled over millions of peasants who tilled the land as they had done for centuries. But they were also faced with a small but growing working class, concentrating some of the largest factories in the world. And the workers were increasingly arrested. There had been an attempt at revolution in 1905, but the Tsar had regained control. Nevertheless, the revolutionary movement began to regain its strength as the First World War approached. The war only intensified the suffering of the Russian people. Famine, poverty and deprivation were a way of life for millions. The war was a disaster for Russia. In the first battle of the war, Russia lost 30,000 killed or wounded, while another 90,000 were taken prisoner. After just five months of war, 390,000 Russians had lost their lives. A year later, even the Ukraina, the Tsar's secret police, were warning of the possibility in the near future of riots by the lower classes of the empire, enraged by the burdens of daily existence. The army was in retreat from 1915, short of arms and equipment. At home, food shortages and inflation led to lengthening queues and a strike wave in the factories. By the 23rd of February 1917, spontaneous food riots started the revolution in Petrograd. Crowds chanting, give us bread, were joined by striking women textile workers. The women struck partly to commemorate International Women's Day, but mainly to protest at the lack of bread. The Tsar told the commander of the Petrograd military district, I command you tomorrow to stop the disorders in the capital, which are unacceptable in the difficult time of war with Germany and Austria. Some soldiers obeyed the order to suppress the demonstrations, but many mutinied and joined the revolution. The government resigned and eventually the Tsar had to concede that his entire apparatus of political and military power had been overwhelmed by the revolution. On the 13th of March he abdicated, ending the 300-year rule of the Romanov dynasty. Two bodies filled the power vacuum created by the abdication of the Tsar. One was the provisional government. Headed by Prince Lvov, it was at first dominated by the pro-capitalist Cadet Party. It had the support of the moderate socialists, who thought that the end of Tsarism would also be the end of the revolution. The other body was the Petrograd Workers' Council, or to use the Russian word for council, Soviet. This institution had emerged in February as a delegate body of factory workers meeting to coordinate strikes, protests and demonstrations against the Tsar. But as more and more factories, districts, army units and peasant villages began sending delegates to the Soviet, it began to emerge as the most important focus of revolutionary activity. And then the Soviet model began to spread into the army and throughout Russia in both the towns and the countryside. These two institutions were bound to clash because they represented two fundamentally opposed visions of how the revolution would develop and what it could deliver to the mass of Russians. The first crisis came in April. The cadet leader Milyukov was determined to keep Russia in the war and made a speech saying that Russia will fight to the last drop of her blood. As Milyukov spoke, Russian soldiers were, according to one British general, being churned into gruel until casualties in the firing line 
should make rifles available. Meetings, riots, protests and street fights between pro and anti-war crowds drove Milyukov from office. It was the end of the cadet-led government. In order to bolster its support among the increasingly militant population, the cadet government co-opted members from the moderate Socialist Party, the Mensheviks, and from the pro-peasant party, the Social Revolutionaries. The moderate socialist, Alexander Kerensky, became leader of the provisional government. But although there were new faces in the government, there were no new policies. In the face of starvation and social breakdown, peasants were seizing the land and workers were taking control of the factories. The provisional government opposed them all. Worse still, Kerensky continued Milyukov's pro-war policy. Kerensky said, the inevitability and necessity of sacrifice must rule the hearts of Russian soldiers. I summon you not to a feast, but to death. But as one war-weary peasant soldier replied, what's the point of the peasants getting the land if I'm killed and get no land? It was an argument of elemental power and it launched tens of thousands of deserting soldiers on the long trek back to their towns and villages in mid-1917. They simply walked away from the front. By this point, the Soviets were growing in power as an alternative source of governmental authority. This process of radicalization was accelerated when the leaders of the revolutionary left, many of whom had spent years in prison and in exile under the Tsar, made their perilous journeys across war-torn Europe and returned to Russia. Leon Trotsky, one of the leaders of the 1905 revolution, made it back from America after being detained by Britain. Vladimir Lenin, leader of the most radical socialist party, the Bolsheviks, returned from exile in Switzerland in a train provided by the German government. The Germans hoped that he would help withdraw Russia from the war. As he stepped down from the train at Petrograd's Finland station, Lenin surprised even his own supporters by insisting that the left should not support the provisional government because it was a pro-capitalist government committed to continuing the war. But Lenin's policy of land, bread and peace chimed exactly with what large numbers of peasants and soldiers were beginning to think. And Lenin's demands were coupled with another slogan which explained exactly how to get these things. All power to the Soviets. The struggle for power between the provisional government under Kerensky and the Soviet now began in earnest. In July 1917, the anger at the provisional government was so great that it almost boiled over into a second revolution. Kerensky used Czech mercenaries to try and drive Russian soldiers to the front, but this simply fueled popular anger. Huge armed demonstrations flooded through the streets of Petrograd. They burst into a session of the Petrograd Soviet, still under the leadership of moderate socialists. One worker, white with anger, leapt onto the podium and, shaking his fist in the face of the chairman, yelled at him, take power when it's given to you. But the demonstrators weren't quite ready for a revolution yet. The July days were, Lenin said, more than a demonstration, but less than a revolution. And as the demonstration subsided, the government moved back onto the offensive against the left. Kerensky created a special unit to hunt down Lenin. They had orders to shoot him on sight. Lenin went into hiding, disguised, as we see in this famous picture from the time, as a worker. Trotsky and other Bolsheviks were imprisoned. Some other Bolsheviks were not so lucky. They were murdered. The party's offices were raided and their printing presses were smashed. Kerensky and the provisional government organised the anti-Bolshevik mood, but they weren't its main beneficiaries. To the right of the provisional government stood the big capitalists of Russia, the old aristocracy and the officer corps of the Imperial Army. The abdication of the Tsar had been a blow to them, but they were still powerful. They dreamt of destroying the left and imposing a military dictatorship. They were willing to use Kerensky in the provisional government, but once they had dealt with the Soviet, they would have had little use for Kerensky. The leading figure of the reactionary right was General Kornilov. From the moment when he arrived in Moscow for the state conference in August 1917, borne aloft from his train by his officers, it was clear 
that a military coup was being prepared. Konilov declared that he would not hesitate to hang all the members of the Soviet if need be. And he was utterly cynical about Kerensky, saying that after he dealt with the Soviet, Kerensky and co. will make way for me. At first, Kerensky thought that he could use Konilov to crush the Soviet. But as soon as he realised that Konilov meant to crush him too, he then realised that he would have to turn to the Soviet for help. Not surprisingly, the Soviet delegates were losing faith in Kerensky and the moderate socialists. Not surprisingly, they did not trust the moderate socialists to organise the defence of the Soviet against the attempted coup. The Bolsheviks, often still in hiding, their leaders still in prison, successfully organised to defeat Kornilov. It was a shattering blow for the right, but it was also a mortal blow for the moderate socialists. Kornilov was defeated at the end of August, and on the 9th of September, the Bolsheviks won a majority in the Petrograd Soviet, and Trotsky became its president. From that moment on, the right and centre were discredited, and the provisional government was a fiction. Power was effectively already in the hands of the Soviet. The revolution of the following month was about making that fact irreversible. On the night of the 25th of October 1917, the storming of the Winter Palace in Petrograd put an end to the provisional government and made the Soviet of workers, peasants and soldiers deputies the new government of Russia. The Soviet kept its promises. It gave the land to the peasants, it gave control of the factories to the workers. Most importantly of all, it took Russia out of the First World War. Despite the ravages of war, it was a spectacular moment of liberation. The first ever women government ministers anywhere in the world took their offices. The oppressed nationalities of the old Russian Empire were offered and some took their independence. Jews, subject to government-sponsored pogroms for generations, experienced a new freedom from fear. After all, Trotsky, himself a Jew, was president of the Soviet. Officers were elected in the army. Factories and farms came under the control of those who worked in them. But the new Socialist Republic was an infant menaced on every side. The pro-Tsarist officers who had supported Kornilov began to form white armies that threatened Petrograd and Moscow with being overwhelmed. They were joined by the armies of the major powers who invaded Russia in order to try and help the whites overthrow the Soviet government. Britain, France, Japan, the United States, Germany and Italy all sent troops to Russia. In fact, a total of 14 different foreign powers sent armed forces to assist in the crushing of the Russian Revolution. As these maps show, the white and foreign armies reduced the territory controlled by the Soviet government to a small fraction of Russian land. Leon Trotsky was made Commissar for War. He described the front in August 1918 as a noose that seemed to be closing tighter around Moscow. The soil itself seemed to be infected with panic. Everything was crumbling. There was nothing left to hang on to. The situation seemed hopeless. The economic situation was as bad as the military situation. The First World War had wrecked the Russian economy. In 1918, Russia was producing just 12% of the steel it had produced before the war. It was the same figure for iron manufacture. Sugar was down to a quarter of its pre-war production level. Coal was just 42% of the pre-war figure. Russia was a starving, broken country surrounded by enemies. The Soviets had to rely on every last drop of enthusiasm from the workers and peasants to sustain themselves. Trotsky created a Red Army out of the ruins of the Tsar's Imperial Army. Propaganda trains toured the front to raise morale. The Red Cavalry rode with the first rank of riders wearing letterboards on their backs so that their fellow soldiers could learn their alphabet as they rode. Whole communities of Jews advanced and retreated behind the Red Army lines so that they could avoid the pogroms carried out by the Whites. The White Armies were composed of old supporters of Tsarism, capitalists, 
and the enemies of the Soviets. Everywhere they ruled was a military dictatorship. But the severity and brutality of the Civil War also took its toll on the Red Army. Forced grain requisitioning became necessary to feed the towns. Conscription was enforced to supply new soldiers. The Tsar was executed to prevent him from becoming a rallying point for counter-revolution. Worst of all, in the long run, the towns were gutted of workers. Factories closed, and in Petrograd, grass began to grow through the deserted cobblestone streets. By 1921, the Red Army had defeated the counter-revolution, and the last foreign armies were in retreat. But the cost of victory was high. The very workers who had made the revolution, who had been delegates to the Soviets, had been wiped out as an effective political force during the Civil War. The Bolshevik Party and the Soviet apparatus were now suspended in mid-air. The class that had given them life had simply disappeared. Inevitably, the state became bureaucratized. It became more and more divorced from the society around it and became increasingly driven by its own interests. There was a battle to stop the bureaucratization of the revolution. Lenin fought against it until he died in early 1924. Leon Trotsky formed a left opposition to try and stop the new bureaucracy from usurping power. But Joseph Stalin, a relatively minor figure in the Bolshevik leadership during the revolution itself, became the dominant figure in the rising bureaucracy. By 1928, Stalin had defeated Trotsky. He drove Trotsky into exile and in this remarkable film, we see Trotsky arriving after his journey from Russia. Lenin and Trotsky's hopes for the success of the Russian Revolution had been based on their belief that it would spread to other countries in the wake of the First World War. These more advanced countries could then assist poor and economically backward Russia to build a society which could meet the needs and desires of workers and peasants. And after the First World War, there was indeed an international wave of revolution. Germany overthrew the Kaiser in 1918. There was a revolution in Hungary in 1919. Italy went through the Biana Rosso, the two red years of 1919 and 1920 when strikes and factory occupations swept the country. In 1926, there was a general strike in Britain. In 1927, there was a revolution in China. But Stalin abandoned hope in the international revolution. Instead, Stalin began rebuilding Russian industry and agriculture by the most savage means. Workers were exploited with military brutality. Farms were forcibly collectivized and the land taken back from the peasants. Political opposition was ruthlessly suppressed. Most of the old Bolsheviks of 1917 were murdered by Stalin some of them after grotesque show trials in the 1930s. In the gulag of forced labor camps, millions were imprisoned and many of them lost their lives. It was a counter-revolution that wiped out the freedoms gained in 1917. Finally, in 1940, an assassin sent by Stalin caught up with Leon Trotsky in his new country of exile, Mexico. The assassin stole into Trotsky's study and plunged an ice pick into the back of his head as he sat working at his desk. The last great figure of the 1917 revolution had been murdered by Stalin's counter-revolution. Stalin had made Russia a great industrial power but he'd done it in the way that old rulers had always done these things, by exploiting the workers and peasants and by destroying any political opposition. Russia was a great power, but Stalin had done what the Tsarists had failed to do. He had killed the revolution. This has been Timeline, the revolutions that made Russia.